Mr. Stockbridge Unified District Board of School Directors, regular meeting Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, 6 30 p.m., Rochester campus, where we are, and via Google Meet, where you are. Um, and call to order uh, adjustments to the agenda. Do we have any? No, no, wonderful, wonderful, great. Uh, sign times and timekeeper. Yep. Hello, sure. Amy. <laughs> you I don't have... feel like I've done my best with this job yet, <laughs> but I will. I will try again. No, I, I, I think it's actually my fault that I'm not actually giving you very good times. <laughs> but I'm actually going to hold things tighter tonight. I think yes, I really want to try and do that. Okay, uh, five consent agenda, public comment. At this point, um, it's looking very quiet. Do we have any phone callers on? No. No. Just... Um, Michaela, do you have a long speech prepared? No, I don't. Okay, good. The number is, well, we'll say five plus whatever. Uh, board comment, I do have one. So I think five is plenty for that. Uh, reports to the board. And uh, last time we ran to 40, I think we gave it 20, and I think we ran to 40. So let's compromise and do 30. And discussion items. Uh, how much do you think? 10 to 15. 10, would be let's long. say 15 just to be tuition real affiliated schools, religious. Um, we're going to take action. Robert's here. Okay, great. Excellent. Robert. Good. Um, the record, let the record show that board member Robert Mayer from Rochester has just stepped in. Uh, it's 8-3, budget presentation, student support budget. What do you think, Jamie, on this? Uh, you know, it's the first draft. 15. There's not much change, so maybe 15 minutes, but. 15. Board goals, uh, 15. Board protocols. Thank you, Justine and Bill, for that. Let's take a look at that for 15. Um, I think we're going to probably take our action in 8-2, so we don't need 9-1. Do we have new hires or resignations? We have one. But that one. won't take that. Okay. And then a final public comment, which will be what it will be. Excellent. Um, I think it actually looks pretty good to me. Um, consent agenda, approved minutes of Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. Can I just jump yes, in quick? Sure. We yeah. only have September 7th. Yep. And I will send your Thursday the 16th. I'm, I'm miss sending that video to our note taker. Oh, so okay. That's a quick note, stop, but I'll have that taken care of okay. the next day. So we have a, do 18. And I'll put together your 18. Okay. So we just have seven to approve tonight. Yep. Okay. Um, I had no problems with it. Uh, I really appreciate our note taker in our note transcriber in Tumbridge. Uh, I'll entertain a motion 4.1 to approve the minutes of Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. So moved. So moved by Robert. Second. Seconded by Bill. Any discussion? Is uh, Kristen's last name spelled correctly? Good. It's L A P A L L E. Good. Okay, so that one needs to be corrected. If yeah. Can we? Under. Oh, lapel. Yep. L L E. It's L A P A L E. L A P A L L E. Okay. I'd like to change my motion, uh, amend my motion to approve the minutes as amended. Thank you. Do we have a second on that? Friendly second. Second. Bill, or second. Fifteen. Huh? It's E N instead of I N for Kristen. Oh. Oh, thank you. Let's get her whole yeah. I mean, like, whatever. <laughs> no, she's doing oh, I, I think her last name is not spelled like that either. I think it's L A P E L L. Yep. We got it. L A P A L L E. No, E L L. No E at the end. L A P E L L. That's right. I go by the post box oh. almost every day. I mean, three turns, but no. okay, right. I think it is. We got it. L A P E L L. Yeah. And Kristen with an E. Correct. I'm, I'm All right. positive that's it. Well, this is just shooting our schedule. All the <laughs> people, we gotta get. Good thing we didn't have those other. <laughs> I know. Wait till I just. Ah, oh, that's it. Back with it. 
Um, okay, as amended, we still have it on the floor. Any further amendments to these notes? No. Very good. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 You guys have it. Good. We have on public comment. Do we have any public comment at this time? Michaela? Tim Pratt, do you have public comment for the board? He's watching a game, I think. Is it tonight? Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. I think we can move on. Uh, board comment. Um, uh, two, two comments. The first is that I know I'm, I'm, I, I don't know who listens to this, but uh, uh, the Rochester PTO could really use some new blood. Um, not that the people who are doing it, they're, they're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're just overwhelmed. There's not a lot of them. And I just would put it out there. If anybody knows anybody, there's a lot of young parents out there. It doesn't have to be women. Um, uh, I think that's an old trope. Um, but just let's put the word out there to get some some new these the people have been doing it have been doing it for a while they've done a lot i know my wife stepped up for the book sale and a lot of other people have but i just think it's a time right now that if people could step up it'd be great um stockbridge sets an incredible example of what a pto can do and how involved they can be and i think we should uh, take that as our model uh the second thing is just for tonight i i am trying some efficiencies really from the protocols that we try and keep things moving a little faster and maybe i so what i'm going to try is not calling out usually i call out and they say do you have a question do you have a question do you have a question for anybody and i'm going to leave it up to you to please either raise your hand digitally justine if you're there or um or raise your hand here for me to call on you if you have a question during reports or if we're speaking just to keep it moving I think I think we're we're getting efficient and we're it's a sign of good good things for us. Justine. Yes, I just wanted to touch back on the PTO piece. Could you um, explain how someone could join? Um, what who sh they should contact and if maybe we could post something on Facebook on the um, district Facebook page for for that. There's there's something getting ready to go home in Thursday folders that. Um, Carrie McDonald sent like as an example of what they used in the past. Mm -hmm. So we're just revising it with new information so they can send it back. And I just don't have it. It's in the works right now. So I can share it with you, Justine, once it's done, if you'd like to post it there. Great. I will. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any further board comment? Yeah. A, a very minor thing and there's no rush on it, but it would be really great to have a cheat sheet for acronyms. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. I've talked that's to, a great I've idea. Talked to him that yeah, I that. I missed that Robert. Cheat, cheat sheet cheat. for acronyms. Ha ha. You know. Yes. That's our oh <laughs> and, and let me just report good news that I just discovered. Um so most of Rochester's forest we were worried was on a man's land who was up for sale. And it is not. Most of our forest outdoor adventure land is on town property according to the map I've seen online, which if it's really true, I need to confirm it at the town to make sure, is it just really, really good news? Because that means we have it and maybe we should get it. Right. And What's the property is no longer for sale. Yeah, and the property is no longer for sale. I was at the property when they pulled it off. So anyway, so that was good news. Okay. That was probably more than five minutes. Well, we're three minutes. We're good. That's perfect. Uh, let's head to reports for the board. Superintendent, 7.1. Uh, so you you all have my report in hand. Uh, there will be, I, all I really wanted to add is there's going to be some more information coming out uh, from me later this week about surveillance testing for families that start to sign up. That's weekly testing for students um, that will start in November and staff. It's voluntary. Um, and there's a, a database that you sign up through the Agency of Education um, and Department of Health that registers uh, students. And then we will begin testing. Um, I believe the test date here is going to be on Thursdays. Um, and the other half of the SU will be on Tuesdays. And so uh, there'll be two days every week. 
But then in addition to that, I'll be sharing information about um, testing to stay in school protocols and procedures. There's multiple uh, different approaches to that. Uh, one is using an antigen test um, that we would test students who are close contacts, not demonstrating symptoms seven straight days, and they would test before they come into the building or they would, they would test right as soon as they come into the building. Those logistics are still being worked out. Um, and then there's also an opportunity for take-home testing for students who are exhibiting symptoms that we can assist families to get hopefully quicker um, results. So all that is forthcoming. We're still waiting on some of the information from the Agency of Ed, but we do plan to launch right into that as soon as it's available. So that's good. And um, I'll take any questions folks have. Um, yes, uh, how's, how are we, I mean, the, I know the staff is, is stretched already. How are they going to be able to handle that? that. <laughs> uh, so we were able, part of why we've been delayed in surveillance testing, uh, and I would say that's probably why most every SU has been delayed, is staffing. So we were able to get a retired nurse um, to join our team. It's Marianne. I got it right. I think that's right. Rosen. I'm going to look uh, I'm gonna butcher her last name, but I'm going to say it's Marianne Arm. Her husband's actually a doctor over here at the Gifford uh, Medical Center here in Rochester. And Marianne's uh, been great. And so she's going to be doing this. Uh, she's going to be the surveillance coordinator. And she'll also be supporting our staffs with implementing the test to stay protocols. Um, so that's why how we were able to do it, Robert. I would say that it's still taxing on our staff um, in general. Um, and I don't, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had positivity at ARSA this year, but I've had uh, significantly more positivity in our buildings than we did most of last year. Um, and so what that just means is the contact tracing that occurs is significant lift uh, for staff and um, folks who are working incredibly hard on it. Um, the good news is we still have not uh, had what we've been able to determine is spread of COVID-19 within the actual school. So that means our mitigation efforts um, are working really well. And again, that's a knock on wood, but in general, the data speaks to masking, washing hands, and uh, really making certain we're, we're paying attention to um, symptoms. And we get that that's frustrating for families, and that's we're hopeful that some of these new methods around testing uh, will assist. I'll just say we while there was out for two days, but we tested right away at Rochester Health Center, and the test result actually came back the next afternoon. That's just so great. That, it, you know, I was hearing three days. That's what they told us, but it actually came back quite quickly. And the new test is just totally different. Yeah, it's really yeah, it's great. Much better. So much less invasive. And hopefully back, you know, hopefully we're vaccinating our youngest students here within the next couple of months, is my hope. Um, and uh, the Help Hub does work with us on that. So those who are eligible age, my buildings that have eligible age students, the Help Hub is providing vaccine right now mm -hmm. um, for for our students. So they will work with us continuously across the SU to help us get our students vaccinated here. That's a great partnership uh, for that. Yep. That really is. Yeah, so those are COVID-19 updates. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I had a question, um, Jamie, on your report, second page, you know, the, I was very hopeful that we were able to deliver on an SU-wide elementary school report card this fall. Uh, abundantly clear that further curriculum development needs to occur prior to delivering this important product. And therefore, you're talking about being um, working on um, more curriculum development and kicking this out next year. So what, tell us a little bit about the, the report card and what impact, if any, would pushing it back a year be on our students? Well, I would say that pushing it back a year really, is, it just has to be right now. We tried to pilot one in the WRVSU. Um, 
uh, Virtual Learning Academy, and it became clear that there were not consistent ends across the grade levels. And we've got a lot of work to do, frankly, in curriculum development. I think there had been quite a bit of time spent in literacy. There needs to be a lot more further time spent in the rest of the content areas. Um, and so, you know, curriculum is an end. And so what I would say is curriculum's not bridges, it's not fountains and Pinnell, right? Like those are approaches, but we need to get more solid in what do we expect each student to be able to know, understand, and do across each grade level cluster. Mm -hmm. And I'm not confident that our teachers, that that was done in a really strategic way that was like transparent and we were holding folks accountable to it. So mm -hmm. what we're doing now is saying, what is it we really want students to know, understand, and do? And that will be a large presentation to the full SU board. Um, because curriculum comes from that, the SU level of that board. Mm -hmm. And then we will then be explicit with teachers. Now it's pretty clear what those ends are. And that's what we would report out on. Um, and so that's the work that needs to happen. It became clearer and clearer to me as I was able to get more into the curriculum world the second half of the year, not spending time on finance and COVID, that those documents were not where we needed them to be. A follow up uh, a question on that. At the SU board meeting, uh, you and Anda made a wonderful presentation about developing um, um, zealous performance result targets that we can incorporate SU wide for our students at, at various or all grade levels. This, this uh, delay on the report card impact that that effort at all? No, because what we're measuring the Common Core State Standards, and that is what we're teaching to. But the report card to me is a different grain size, right? Like that is what are our like, what I'm going to use as a word called performance indicators. And performance indicators build to your standard. Yeah. And so what I would say is, is those performance indicators are the areas where I don't think there's continuity across all of our buildings at this point. And part of that is expectations, right? And so what I'm saying is, is I don't fully, I don't feel confident enough to know that all of our first grades are calibrated. Mm -hmm. And that's the work that we need to do. And so, you know, a report card should be the communication tool to say, this is what we're teaching and this is how the student's performing. And the issue we have right now is I don't believe that it's calibrated about what we're teaching and where the students performing across all my first grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the work I think we need to do before we go saying, all right, now we're going to report out on that. So that was that's that's the heavy lift there. But as far as those scale scores go, I mean, those are those are reporting out on the Common Core State Standards. And that is what we're teaching to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just the difference in brain size. Thank you. Further questions? Good. <laughs> Moving on, please. Principal. Yes, that was a packed report. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. Yeah, that's great. It's a lot of good things. Yeah, All good things. It is. Um, do you have my report? I want to highlight just a couple things and put out another public service announcement. We are short staffed from the substitute standpoint. Like I spent my day in preschool and then as a paraeducator and then as the librarian today, which I loved. It was great, but it um, makes it difficult sometimes. Um, so we are trying and it's a range of things and staff are really flexible and trying to help out when, but if you know someone who'd like to be a substitute in either building, we would happily welcome them aboard um, and start that process. And they can talk to myself or Erica or uh, Janet to get that process started. So we didn't do a, a full-time sub. Even with the full-time sub in both buildings, we are short-staffed in substitutes. Not every day, but just to get a day where one or two people are out and it starts to become a problem. Yeah, our bench is just never deep right. past those. So is, no, we do have those still in place. How is that long-term sub? Uh, is, what, or what, I'm not sure what it's floating, full, floating sub, full-time sub. How does that, is that working well? Very well. And we'll talk about that in the budget okay. about keeping that in both buildings. But yeah, 
Mm -hmm. It's definitely a great thing. I can't imagine the past two days without it. Okay. So, right. um, and then we've done lots of assessments. We're up and rolling in every part of our uh, curriculum for the most part. And then just the other piece that I forgot to add in the board report was just about trust structures, mm -hmm. structures. And that was my email last night. Just that um, Tara and I have worked with Aiden and we have a quote and it's in the ESSER monies to be able to expand or extend one of each of the trusses to make them larger on both campuses and then to add one in Stockbridge, one more in Stockbridge and two more in Rochester to kind of fill the need. Okay, yeah, great. And I think that's, till we get to data, that's kind of it, unless people have questions. And that having those structures will just keep us outside so much more. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if folks know that, like, we don't even eat lunch inside. We use the structures outside on both campuses. That's great. That That's lunch. cool. I'm going to, I'd like to experiment a little bit with using some of the previous tent sides on the sides of the structures yeah. just yeah, to I see if how much idea. flapping there might be. But if we can get a little wind, you know, the wind tunnel effect, to cut that down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see what that looks like. I think probably I'll see some of the pole pieces too as part of. Just trademark it, though. Even. Sure, of course. Of course. Um, good. Any other questions for our principal? How you doing? No. <laughs> business 7-3, business manager. Hello, Tara. Good evening, everyone. You have my report. Only updates I have, the auditors completed their physical audits here yesterday, and now they'll Great. continue to work through doing um, the rest of the audits virtually. And the projected first draft is the third week of November. And then the rest of my report is in your discussion items. And Tara, can I just add to your report that we will have a uh, projected projection, the two-pager in November, right? That's what we talked about? Yes, for, for the first year. quarter. Yep. Questions for our business manager? My well, guys, we have a reputation of polls. We got three-hour meetings at least. <laughs> oh, good. Great. You're doing great. Thank you so much, Tara. <laughs> Very good. Uh, moving on to WRVS, RVSU. Thank you. Policy committee draft number five for the anti racism policy. Um, this has, <clears throat> we met the last <clears throat> step was the first time we had talked um, at a board, full board level about the policy. It then moved out of the committee and to the policy. Uh, and there still seems to be, though, there's some uh, a small, significant energy um, challenging the policy. The, the vast majority of the full board and and the responses we're getting are pro, very positive about this, and a lot of feeling like let's get it into place, let's use it, let's see how it works. Um, that a policy is a tool, and you see how well it works. Um, the motion was to send it off, and we're we're tabling it for October. We're bringing it. We're bringing it forward to October right. to vote up or down. So that's where we are right now. There were some slight edits. In draft five, there is. Yeah, yeah. Draft and you five. should be able to see them. Um, um, there's strike throughs and yeah, yeah. Like folded. Um, and there was some comment too that that they felt that some of the things being taken out were possibly weakening the policy, but. You know, I think I think there is also a sense of come on, but let's let's do this. Let's do this. Let's 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 push it forward. We've we've had there's been challenge about public comment. There's been a lot of public comment. There's been two public sessions that were very well attended, and um, uh, uh, and we have a, a documented quite quite an extensive responses, written responses that people have put in, overwhelmingly positive about this. So. Um, that's where the SU board is now. The SU full board is or executive. It's the full board. I'm gonna have it. I'm gonna bring you all together for the full board, and that is the, the twenty third. Um, 
Yes, that's the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Or is this month was the twenty September was the twenty. Anybody? I got a look. Good. Okay. Good. That's uh, it's right here too. So fourth Monday. Monday. Fourth Monday, twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Yeah. What's the difference? Glad <laughs> somebody. That was good. Uh, uh, I would encourage you all to be there. It's um, just sort of you know it's been a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of publicity about it. Um, there's been other places are dealing with this same issue, and I think we're a bit of a leader in this program right now. You know, I think it's a really strong policy, yeah, and I think we've had a good process. Yeah. Good. Any okay. question? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, I just have a question. Are we a leader? I was under the impression that we are the leader. No, other districts have adopted oh, they? anti racism policies okay. too. So we're, um, we're with the lead group. We're with a lead group, yeah. I mean, I would say some have um, had it more broadly defined as equity, mm -hmm. um, like Essex Westford. That's, I know, mm -hmm. the title of their policy. I believe it's the same as Brandon yeah. over here with Gene Collins. Um, but, you know, I, I must say, I think our process has been really strong. Um, and I think we've had really respectful debate about it. Um, and I hope that the public has felt heard. I mean, I think we've offered that opportunity and listened. I think there, you know, if you look at the multiple drafts, it is clear, I think, that the policy committee has taken that feedback and really used it to inform the, the policy, so. Good, that's great. So um, if the issue board both at their October meeting, then they, then they it'll come right they to come you back to the individual matter. district boards to do to, uh, to vote yay yeah. or nay. Is that correct? Correct. And if that's the case, we would have it in our November agenda. Yep. Good. Thank you. Further questions? There being none. WRBSU full board news. Um, <laughs> you were there too, Bill. Um, Help me. Uh, I think the, the as Bill pointed out, one of the biggest things was the presentation by Anda and Jamie about academics. Um, and Bill pays just this hears that stuff better than I do. Um, I was a little surprised actually just that Bill and I were the only ones present for the whole board. I know. I and I really sense. feel like um, I would love to make a statement somehow that if we're asking our teachers to be out there we need to be in the in the buildings you know we can't we it got we got comfortable with COVID, and i just think we need to show up and i know that's i'm speaking to the church a little bit or the choir whatever it is um but uh i the, i was i was a little disappointed not to see more board members there um what you probably took a lot more substantial well it was interesting because we had um the development director for the vermont School Board Association uh, giving a kind of a professional development for the SU board. Thank you. Um, and it uh, was interesting because um, she got herself a little bit into a, into a firefight over um, the important distinction of the role of the boards as policy and vision. Um, and but the day-to-day -day management of the schools up through the superintendent, the superintendent's team. The question was, she had some ideas about um, and feelings about if that's the case, then um, meetings where um, the school boards meet with, including the, the school superintendent, that sort of thing could confuse the line of, of communication, which is supposed to be through the superintendent. You mean uh, and, um, meetings that include the principal? Yes. Yeah, the principal. And, um, and we really shouldn't actually be talking to the principal at all. Well, that's school board. She, she, that was that's one thing we, we want to talk about in our protocol to, yeah. to, to kind of um, clarify that or just to have the same expectations on that. Uh, the worst case scenario is, and I've been in situations where boards will, individual board members will go and talk to staff and tell the staff to do things. And first of all, individual board members do not have the authority to do that. The only authority comes through the entire board. And then secondly, the staff member is looking at, well, who, who do I report to this individual board member or to the superintendent or the superintendent? And that leads to stress and some, some really um, 
negative consequences. So I think that's what she was trying to, yes. uh, what we need to do is be sensitive to that, wise to that, so we don't get ourselves in trouble, but at the same time have good communication between staff and boards. And uh, in my short observation here with the team, I, I think we're very strong in that. Uh, people aren't hiding, ducking, weaving. Um, it, it seems to me we're, we're a strong team together. And so that was one interesting thing. The other thing was, and Jamie, you should talk to it. Um, one thing we talked about at our retreat was we've got the metrics about student performance. Can we now start, now that we've got that groundwork laid, can we now set some goals about where we want to be in student performance at the end of this school year? And um, Jamie made a presentation to the SU board and they gave a thumbs up for uh, the superintendent's team to uh, develop uh, metrics and goals uh, for this academic year. And um, and that will come forward to the full board this next meeting. So it's, it is an important meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would assume if the SU board accepts that, then it goes down and we have a sense Correct. of that as well. Yep. The power to me is when you've got the full SU board metrics, then you don't have these Part of the problem with metrics is if the sample size is too small, then any change can be uh, overly or misinterpreted. And so to have our metrics be able to do the whole system wide as well as individual schools and grades will help deter that uh, the downsides of that. But I was very heartened by that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we had talked about that, and that's something I think will be a, a very powerful arrow arrow in our quiver going forward. So thank you. Um, just to follow up, um, this is something I'm remembering now that I thought about. I think it's very important that we put out the information that if there is an issue with the school, that it goes to the principal. Mm -hmm. And I think that could go out in a newsletter. I think mm -hmm. it could go out because I think that it also protects us a little bit, but also, keep, you know, just that it, I think a lot of people just don't know. I, I know Amy. I don't know Lindy. I don't know her phone number or anything like that. And that we, you know, do that. And I think the other part of this is is trust. And I think we've just established a level of trust that we're not going to be telling you what to do, and that you know we're working together. And I think I can understand where the VSBA was coming from because they certainly are hostile boards and principals that don't get on and superintendents that don't get on. I mean, it could be a mess. And in that case, I think it probably is very helpful. But there was some other board members that sort of spoke to, we need to have our principal there, especially with COVID going on, that we just need to know from the ground zero sort of where the hell that's going. Good. Anything further on that? Uh, yeah, I was I was at the the portion of the training and and the thing that I really I really did enjoy the 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 possibilities of structuring our meetings and our 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 board protocol that I worked on a little bit with with Bill um, based on their, the way they they suggested and I think we'll be able to talk more about that in our board protocol section. But I think um, we do have a good relationship with the administration right now, but. If we establish a solid protocol now, I think um, if that's not the case in the future, we can glean from these trainings um, a good system to go forward. So I did enjoy, I was there for that part and I was happy to hear all of that information. Good. I think we're moving on. Discussion okay. items. Five under. Man. Oh, we need ice cream or something. <laughs> For each one we get under. Um, <laughs> fall 8 1, fall academic data report principal Stetson will share the fall universal assessment report for both reading and mathematics. Yeah, so one, I'll print in color from now on. No. No. Um, so a couple of things. One, we've never presented um, out by grade level before. Usually our cohorts have been too small to do that. So this is actually, this is Rochester and Stockbridge together. And it's five grade levels. So you can really see a breakdown. So it may seem very dramatic in some differences compared to what you've seen in the past when we've lumped like grades 
think it was like four through six together and K through three together. So I just don't don't um don't fair apples to apples there. Yeah. Right, it isn't, but this will give us more. This is how we'll do it. And we yeah, we'll measure the cohort. I mean again, I keep wanting to get after cohort growth. Right. right. So over you'll be time. Able to... Great. And that's what our goals will be uh focused on. So reporting on grade levels I thought was just absolutely critical in each right. one of our districts. So, and it's a little more visual too, instead of just percentages, which is nice as well. Um, so we've seen some great growth in literacy. I think what I will say about this, in addition to my report, is we still have work to do in our universal instruction. These differences of kids that are not um, necessarily meeting the expectations yet, that's not always gonna be fixed by intervention. That's something that we need to up our game in, in our, in our classroom instruction for every kiddo. Um, we did meet today as a staff. This actually was the focal point of what we talked about in our staff meeting today about how we move forward with this and deep diving into individual grade level um, data. And we talked about how, what we have, what we need and what needs to happen to start our goal setting process around this. And our focus and goal setting was truly around student growth. So really digging into that um, scale score which is, this little, yeah. these are the skill score ones down here, and mm -hmm. looking at that to measure our student growth yeah. instead of getting fixated on like who made it and who didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And this is comparing it to uh, what, what's the district? So oh, we're Rochester, the district, the dark line is us, Rochester, Stockbridge, and the faded line is the state okay. growth score. Um, for meeting expectations at this point in the year. So you'll see that skill score continue to grow as we move throughout the year. Yeah, okay. Now just to also add, we did up the the, the cut threshold mm -hmm. for STAR 360 for the scale score. What's that mean? Uh, so we increased it. So the scale score now is now aligned to the national average that we're using to measure whether or not our students are meeting the benchmark we're using the state. Uh, expectation and so this should be a much better projection of how our students should do on the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium SBAC mm -hmm. which is the summative assessment we have in the spring um, which the AOE uses to measure how effective our instruction is and so these these cut scores these scale scores you're seeing the faded line that is where we would expect to be for a scale score if we would expect to meet the expectations in the spring. So you're going to see that faded line continue to increase each report you get. And that's because it's it's a trajectory toward where we need to be by the end of the year. And let me, hopefully this was useful. This is what I got out of the time we met with Anda and Bill and Lindy privately. Right. This idea that sort of halfway in between these numbers is, is sort of this is the score of the whole class that you have people up there and you have people down right there. it's an average it's an average that dark line but is the, an average. that has helped me a lot to put those lines there to sort of think of it as the whole that's the whole class and that you have people above and below right. um and that and that some people are almost in the next in the next grade right. level in terms of how they're doing um i don't know for me that just helped visually and it might help other people and scale score, as Anne is saying, scale score is really what we're focusing on now. That's a term that we should all be familiar and, with. And we're focusing on it not only for cohorts to measure our effectiveness really in curriculum. Mm -hmm. So when we look at overall cohort, one of the things I'm looking at and what I've said to the principals and our teachers are is, do we have a curricular issue, right? Like if, if our students are all performing low on a certain grade level, the first thing we need to do is don't immediately go to pointing your finger inward, right? And personalizing scores. Mm -hmm. Should be saying, well, what standards are our students missing? Mm -hmm. Right, so then we analyze the data at that level. And then if we realize that in general across the ESU, and this is why we're bringing 40 educators together to do this data training, is if we're recognizing that we're having issues across the ESU in certain grade levels and certain content in your areas and standards, then that's a curriculum issue and we need to address that. Now, there also could be instructional issues, right? Like if we're seeing one building is, we get an issue and other buildings don't, or one building's performing really well mm -hmm. and others aren't over time, then what's that building doing? Like what's yeah. the instructional practice that's happening? 
that is really making certain that they're meeting those standards. So those are the things that we're looking to analyze. Nice. But also we are looking at these scale scores individually. So my expectation is, as we get better with data, that we're setting not just goals for cohorts, we're setting goals for every individual student. Well, I was wondering if this could be part of um, a parent-teacher meeting. On the student? Yeah, absolutely. On the student. Yeah. Because I think the more we introduce this to parents and and say scale scores, okay, this is this is this is where you are in the scale. Um, or this is where we, you know, we assess. I don't know. I just think then we're again transparency. It's all the things we believe in. I think it's the uh, what I realized is it seems to me that our culture a little bit in the S is did assessment because we had to. Yes. Right? Yes. And not we did assessment okay. to really use it to inform instruction. Yes. yes. Right. And, is, and so assess. right now we are trying to shift this culture around like. It's not a bad thing. Assessment shouldn't be an ugly word. Right. And it should be used to inform instruction, right? Yeah. And to have conversation with parents. About right there, that, account, that statement is something that should go out on a regular basis because I think it really is a paradigm shift we're asking for. Yeah. Because I do think most people think assessment is just like, oh, yeah. I just have to do it. Yeah, and and, okay. and that it's really a tool. And, and I think a lot of people go, MPSS, what's MPSS? Um, and I think this is the heart of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's the heart of it. it is. Is. And so the same conversation is the conversation we had as a staff today. Mm -hmm. And next week we break into K through three cohorts to dive even more. And actually Chris Ward, who's running the data inquiry class that several of us are taking, will actually be helping us facilitate that conversation. All He's from the Upper Valley Educators yeah. Institute. You so we can that. move to having grade level growth it, it, the overwhelming consensus today was to focus on student growth mm -hmm. and that we should see some great gains and we need to make that measurable for ourselves as a goal. This just all sounds like you guys are going in such the right direction. <laughs> we are. It just it's is really, exciting it's really to be talking exciting about yeah. instead of some other things. It's and really wonderful. Yeah. Like the huge celebration to just share out of all of this is our grade one every single child. And we remember we haven't put a lot of effort in well, I was looking for the, I was so looking for the shade. There's right. no there's no, no um there's no deciphering. The entire grade one is meeting or exceeding expectations in mathematics. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take it. Wow, that's great. I think you said this is both schools. This is this is both schools. And so even if you wow. look at them on the scale of the score, you'll see that they're um they're off the chart. Yeah, the, I think that was a typo, but it's the eighty two, huh? Yeah. Um, and there's more than one student in grade one. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I was going to make that joke. Bill. It is a smaller cohort, Bill. It is a smaller cohort right around 10 together. But hey, for we'll us, take that's, it. That's we'll kind of average. It. We'll take it. It's a huge celebration. And so that's amazing. Trying to I, really figure was, out, I was looking for the gray shading. Yeah. I felt so. like I needed to point that out for multiple reasons. Robert, I'm oh, sorry, Robert. Yeah, you know, I, I'm anticipating this is such an excellent work, and I'm anticipating in the future that we will, won't be surprises, but anyone who's been in education for a long time will know that there's certain classes have certain character, and it's just because of their makeup and right. their, 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 their the parents and all that stuff, and you know, there'll be certain classes that are harder to teach. Yep. And you know, that doesn't mean you're not you're just going to accept it, but we will watch it as it, it progresses across this chart <laughs> over the years and where you have to put your energies. Yep. Yes. Yep. Right. And that's that's, that's that's the wonderful thing about this approach. Yes. Assessment, assessment is a guide, not a punishment. That's right. Yeah. Right. Um, Excellent. Um, I think these graphics are definitely something. In this is all on the. I can't take any. Credit. Well, but I'm just saying an annual check. report. Yeah. You know, oh, this absolutely. is a graphic that needs to be in our annual, annual report. Um, and an explanation. Yeah. An explanation for those parents who want to want to take a look. Great. Uh, I just have Other a question. Questions? Yeah, question. These uh, initial uh, assessments. This is kind of the benchmark for the year. Mm -hmm. uh, have and you've looked at these results and discussed it with your faculty. Um, are, are any of these results are going to or need to change 
our curriculum or our strategy or our techniques or our um, focus uh, to move these some of these kids faster or quicker or whatever they can do. In other words, are there any things in here that you said, well, we don't have to be doing so much here, but we got to do much more there. I mean, or is this pretty much what you expected and your strategy going forward over the next nine months uh, is basically um, on course? So um, twofold, specifically into literacy, math, it's a, a very early to tell because we have not had consistent mathematics instruction mm -hmm. as long as I have uh, been here. It's been a hodgepodge depending on who the teacher is, what building you're in. In literacy, what I can say is we have implemented aspects of universal instruction with fidelity very well um, around like F and P would be the word. What we now need to do in literacy to add to our instruction is a focus on writing, is a focal point and how to implement um, you know, vocabulary. Those are just some of the areas that we're really seeing that that's the next step of our universal instruction that needs to happen. Um, and we know this now, like we've done it for a couple of years, virtually and in person. Um, so we know those pieces. So it's also that concept of like, what do we need? And as we think about our moving forward and using grant money and writing our continuous improvement plan or updating it, those are things we need to add. I think it's also just strengthening content area knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, I think teaching reading, you really need to understand phonics. Um, and the different syllable types and really understand language, right? And so what I would say is that one of the things we're, we're focusing on why we are partners, partnering with the Stern Center is to better strengthen those phonics teaching skills for our K-1-2 teachers. Uh, we really need to make certain that those teachers have a really strong understanding of the English language and how to teach reading when a student is struggling, right, with the approach we're using. Um, and so that's part of what we're looking to do too. And it's why we are working with the Stern Center for Language and Learning out of uh, Burlington. Um, I do have a question um, looking at the, the math scale. Um, I noticed, so for math, we are able to do it grades one through six, but yes. in reading or not. Right. So reading, we use something that's called like the early literacy assessment, okay. which just helps identify things like not understanding phonics, things like that doesn't necessarily give you reads for okay. um, a test out of it. Last school years, um, mm -hmm. kindergarten and first graders, in, were they together in both schools? Were they a, a blended group? K-1 K yes. in, in both schools? Yes. So you could, I could almost see why a second grader could potentially be at the same level as a first grader because they were in the same class together. Yeah, potentially. You know, that would be, yeah. But I would okay. say that that would that feel flag for us. Yes, right. Uh, around multi age. Right, that's that kind of what I was getting at. As soon as I dug into this data grade level wise, I said to Onda, we need to peel back. That so when you look at second grade data, for example, most of the need of concern is all in first grade level skill. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That, that, Just how to that's differentiate, something. right? Like right. teaching math in a multi-age yeah. classroom is difficult. It's, yeah. It's a, it's it's an a, a content area that really you have to work incredibly hard to do it. Yeah. And yeah. so further develop professional development to ensure that we're getting it right. Uh, and that's why we're focusing on that. Is, right? is there yeah. any options for possibly separating grade levels within that multi-age class mm -hmm. so that... So we've done it a couple different ways in each building. It's been multi-age here in Rochester. We have done it as content in Stockbridge. Um, what I will say is not currently, because it's been made pretty clear, but in previous years, math is one of the first classes that got cut short continuously so right. to be able to think that you're going to get through just what you need to universally when you keep shortening classes was not a realistic expectation mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's multi-age or it's one 
it's K1 in Stockbridge and it's 1, 2 in Rochester. So it is multi-age, but there's, we have been using our floating sub as well as face every to kind of push in to help provide additional support so we can break those groups apart and teach them at the multi-age level. But I think it's yeah. it's something that is certainly at the SU level. Yeah. Again, it's not just our side for me with these multi-age classrooms right. that I'm monitoring mm -hmm. to see if Way we need to small make schools. Yeah, and I just think we need to at some point, if the data is not Traject the trajectory is not good based on what we're doing, then I think we, we're going to have to make some decisions around. Mm -hmm. Do we need to look at scheduling strategically so that math's not in a multi age setting mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it is in straight grades? Mm -hmm. And that's um, great because it's data driven. Now we've yeah. got it. Now, yeah, I feel like I can pull it apart and it's it's real data so that we can use it to make some of those informed decisions. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Justine, you look like you have a question. I have just kind of an idea, and I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but I um, I do know that a lot of times parents have a hard time teaching their kids math because it's different than what they're used to or what they've learned. And I don't know um, anything about whether the school has ever offered any support for parents to kind of help the kids at home a little bit more. I don't know if there's any room or possibility for something like that. Um, either from the board or uh, I don't a know. great what? idea just sorry just Bonnie Bonnie did do some nights did a night or maybe two last year yeah that we recorded okay. and sent out but I think it is worthwhile for us to do more of those I, I think now that with this technology piece where it, it becomes more convenient for parents to be able to both watch a video maybe after an actual uh, you know class you know had, so you, you could either attend or in the weeks following you can go and look at it. I think the other big thing for us to make certain we communicate with parents too is that we certainly teach more of the abstract approach now to math right like yeah. the conceptual like understanding it. behind yeah. it but at the end of the day that all does lead up to standard algorithm which is what we were all taught Justine mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we all learned in standard algorithm so I, I've always said to parents, I don't want you to ever feel like you're going to mess them up. And I think it's important for us teachers to communicate that mm -hmm. to yeah. our students, because at the end of the day, standard algorithm does get you to the correct answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just right? Even though you, you may not way. be doing it through the, <laughs> you know, right. yeah. the conceptual understanding approach around it or the pictorial model around it that, some, you know, that leads them through to the standard algorithm. But um, I think it's important for our families to know, and maybe that is something that I will discuss here in an upcoming letter, Justine, now that you say it, because um, I don't want families, parents to feel like they're going to mess their child up. You're not going to mess them up. Yeah, um, yeah that's good. So, a really good point. I, I definitely have heard parents talk about that, you know, in the, over the years, um, even when I was working in school where parents felt like they couldn't do anything. And right. it, it, it doesn't really help to have them feel that way. So that's a good point to make for sure. But yeah, just an idea how we can beef that up. Oh, good just to be talking about this stuff. Robert. Um, something that was briefly touched on in, in our retreat and, and such is, uh, and I'm wondering where it fits all into the mix. And, and I've also been introduced to a, uh, a new term, uh, transferable skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, you can guess who we're from. And um, uh, also one that was mentioned in, in one of your the, the, your documents earlier that I first read was grit, which is, is right. the same. And I'm just wondering, I, I understand it's going to affect all these scores, but do you assess it? Do you, how, how are you approaching that? We need to assess it is the answer. And I think, you know, the best way for us to ass assess it is to start to develop more performance task assessments. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when you've heard me talk about a capstone project, mm -hmm. that's a year long project where a student has to develop a product. I believe that that is a really authentic way to measure something like grit. And so part of what I think we're going to be looking to do as we start to develop more of these performance type tasks across the grade levels is to say, all right, what are those transferable skills? And 
based on a rubric, how do we actually measure them and define proficiency? I get excited because that's really important work. I will tell you that we are several years behind mm -hmm. other districts in this work. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is that does allow us to learn from some folks' mistakes um, in that regard. And uh, so, you know, I would say that we are going to use those lessons learned to make certain that we don't fall into some of those same traps. Um, and what I mean by that is I think a lot of supervisory unions and districts spend a lot of time focusing on how do we communicate our proficiency via report card or transcript. And that hijacked the conversation from how do we use proficiency to actually change teaching. Mm -hmm. And I want us to be hyper-focused on how do we use proficiency to change our instructional approach for kids and our ability for students to demonstrate what they know and understand and can do mm -hmm. instead of worrying about transcript. Um, and so that that is work that when I talk about the SU report card, it's part of why I felt like we had to put the pause button on. Because I thought, again, we were going to spend more time on the reporting mechanism that we weren't quite ready to launch and less about how do we improve our instructional practice, right? The pedagogy for kids. Um, and so that's, you know, the. The two things go hand in hand, but I think in general at school, sometimes we get too caught up in what maybe looks pretty or how we talk about it. And you can focus a lot of time and energy debating that and not actually get to the meat of it, which is the mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I'm trying to do is keep our organization much more focused on the teaching and the student outcome that way and not allow, allow this to sidetrack us, but we still do have to do this. I think we got to get this right first. So I don't know if, that, if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Again, it comes down a little bit to trust. You know, when you say a word like grit, maybe we don't have a way to um, assess it yet, but I get what you mean and the trust that you're going after it. Um, is that is that somewhat the point, Robert? Or well, uh, yeah. I mean, at, at this point, we're if we're as you say, perhaps uh, far enough back that uh, we 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 know that we have to teach it. We have to have some sort of, of assessment mechanism because we don't know what we, to measure it because we don't know if we're successful in teaching. Yeah. So that's really where what, what the big point is, is we have to be able to assess it. And I think the communication of that is last, uh, if, if I understand your communication to the, the outside world and such and, and making transcripts is the last part. The, the, the primary focus is, is, are we being successful in our, our approach? We're we good on this? Yep. How's our time? Thank you so much, Lindy. We're over by nine. Sarah, okay. Okay. I'm the ice cream back. That's okay. That was a good topic to be over by nine. You're right. Yeah, thank you. are going to make it up. Well, I, 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 so, 8 2 tuition at religiously affiliated schools. Um, I thought we had a good discussion about this last time. Um, Still, so yeah, I'll just add, still only one board's taken action thus far, mm -hmm. uh, which is Granville Hancock. They uh, voted to um, pay tuition up to the state average. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that based on my conversations with districts thus far, I feel like that's the way the other districts are leaning. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I don't think there's a right or wrong here uh, in this approach. That's the way I would lean. I, I think the point made last time was about li um, liability and that better than liability come at the SU level or we're a little more protected than at the individual level. Well, it would be even more than I that. Be more the SU it's going to be like, yeah. Yeah. Is, it, yeah. is, it, is it state or federal? The, this was a federal yeah. decision. Right. So, dollars. right. To pay. Tara, you have something to say? I see you come on. No, you're just there. Okay, good. Um, do we have a motion? But just, yeah, just to remind everyone, and Michaela, you weren't here. So the, there was a Supreme Court ruling that came out of Montana that uh, publicly, that public 
funds, public dollars, could sh shall be used to um, fund uh, tuition at, at, at religiously affiliated schools. And since you are a school district of choice, um, that then requires us to pay those publicly funded tuition dollars to a religiously affiliated school. There's a Vermont Supreme Court ruling that says you can't use public fund dollars for the teaching of the church. And so there's, you could put a procedure that requires each individual school to designate what percentage of that fund is going for, to the direct teaching of the church or to support the church. Um, and so the, I would say that the one thing with that procedure is if you do that, um, we do fully expect that there will be possibly a suit brought against schools who do withhold uh, those public fund dollars by um, probably more of a, at a national level, mm -hmm. we're going to challenge that Vermont Supreme Court ruling, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, right. So you just said that the Vermont Supreme Court says the opposite of what the federal. No, <clears throat> they no. Okay, they don't. That is, sorry, did you, no, I Vermont Supreme again. Court says you can't use public fund dollars for the direct support and teaching of the church. Okay. Right. And so that's where this percentage procedure comes in. That's church, not religion, though. Whereas the other one is a religious affiliated school. Could be a synagogue, could be a mm -hmm. mosque, could be not a church. No, but like Rice Memorial, for example, is a Catholic school. Right. So if you were to implement this procedure, you would have to get from Rice the percentage of the day where they are or the percentage right, of the tuition, tuition right are supporting the church i understand that i'm just wondering if is it causing us any trouble with what the vermont supreme court ruling is versus the federal if we don't do it that way if yeah, we our don't. attorney says absolutely not okay justine yeah. justine hi uh, the answers just keep popping up. It, it, that's I, I'm I'm on the same page. Um, I was going to explain maybe what I thought of the Vermont versus the federal situation, but um, it's all out there now. That's all. The, there's a decision in, in you know a federal decision, and then there are some states that are challenging schools um, in the same way that Jamie was descri has described. Um, there may be suits brought challenging the schools who are doing this, but it kind of wraps back around to the federal decision in Montana. You're, you're probably going to get sued either way in some fashion. Yeah. There's truth to that. Yeah, yeah. right. I, I, I really, I think that. Can I say something else? Sure, why not? Um, I know Menden has been dealing with this, so Rutland RSUD, there was a big deal in that because Menden, um, a lot of the children in this country go to Christ the King or MSJ. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a big conversation, but it was about equity of their students um, accessing. So um, so the tuition was, is higher at MSJ. And so it put on parents to pay, pay the difference. To pay the difference. And so then was that fair? Um, because maybe I couldn't pay for my child to go, but the next kid could go. So that was a bit of a that's certainly what Granville Hancock is. An discuss. issue, yeah. Um, and then the other interesting part to that was um, so the the fairness. Um, it wasn't so much about the religious, you know, the, the percentage of the day, but I also thought it was interesting. Um, and how, and I'm curious how public funds, um, over a private school. So, so we we only pay up to the state average. Um, right, because we don't actually have any say after, right? I mean, if it's a public... If it's a so public, at any independent school, you can only pay based on school choice up to the state average is what we would pay up to. That's our that's our process and procedure for any... For any spending. Private. Like, yeah, we pay up to the state average. Um, I just thought it was interesting when listening to that conversation about if public... If so kind of just um, a really good on the school if um, they can take a student or not take a student. Um, in some of the a, private any private school, school can do that. Private, yeah. even so the not, sharing academy. Was it, right. I guess it wasn't so much um, about private religious funds. Private versus public. Private versus public. Yeah, I think that was a big 
Yeah, so for any private institution, we pay up to the state average. We don't go over that. I mean, I, I could see. This would be all pay, possibly paying under the state average. Is, is, is this a, a, a supervisory union policy that determines? We that? will move to a supervisory union policy. The issue is that there we hadn't taken it up, nor was there any type of example around policy, because this was just came out of the spring. So I'm doing it district by district mm -hmm. for this upcoming year. So uh, just to kind of comment on what you were saying, um, the the uh, the schools uh, were actually billing parents for the balance, whereas other private schools potentially, like Sharon Academy, are not. They're just they charge the district for the average cost, and they're not they're not billing back the parents, but they potentially could. That's, it would be the well, Sharon thing. Academy charges the state average. Uh, right, but it, uh, any any independent school what would have the seen, capability to do that if they felt that that was their, what they needed for their What district. we've seen more of is when a family chooses to access an independent school, typically outside of the state of Vermont, like the Kimball Union yeah. um, is an example I know of, and we just pay the state average, and then the family receives the difference. Or the, I mean, Kimball, that Sometimes they do scholarship. They, yeah, yeah, right. We just get the bill for the state average. So, I mean. So, the, the conversation you're discussing, I think, to give it apples to apples, is mm -hmm. student chooses a religiously affiliated school. They charge the state average. Let's say they charge it. If you put in a procedure that says, tell us what percentage of that money goes to support the church, and let's say it was 20%. The balance would be on the, the balance parents. would be on the parents. Yeah. Where Sharon Academy, you pay the state average, right? The bill mm -hmm. comes to the district, and that's what you pay. Right. So that's the conversation we're having. Well, the only concern I would have about the um, about doing it or not doing that it that way is just the Vermont court ruling. What type of liability is that put on us? By it wouldn't it wouldn't probably put any liability on us. I mean, certainly a group could come to and sue the district not just you, multiple districts who are paying up to the state average and say you're using public fund dollars, there's a Supreme Court hearing on the books, and now we're naming you in multiple districts in this suit. And then there's the other way where if we don't pay up to the state average, I can, I'm pretty certain that there's going to be Probably not within Vermont, but an outside group outside of the state of Vermont, because remember, this is federal. They are going to come in and challenge what's on the books for the Vermont Supreme Court. Right. And they're going to say, oh, schools, you have overstepped here. Mm -hmm. Right. And you need to pay up to the state average like you do every other independent school, right. because now you have a prejudice. So changing the Vermont uh, Supreme Court ruling. Essentially, that would go could go back to. Yeah. I don't know. I will tell you. I don't that, know law at all. So. Really, I, I think the better way, because either way, we're going to kick this to this bit. This is why you pay yeah. Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust. And Pietro Lynn's office is going to represent us <laughs> and every other district that's named in it, either way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's really, I think, the best way for you to make this decision is just about. What do you guys feel? Do you feel like you should require Cross each body, school to designate? Or do you feel like, no, we're, you know, there's a, you know, what I said, I'll come back to what Brando Hancock said. That's the only example I can give you. They said, no, there was a, there was a federal decision. And who are we to say we are a school choice district? where those families want to choose. It's now the law of the land in the, in the country that you can use public dollars, that you have to use public dollars now if you're a school choice district to support even a religiously affiliated independent school. And that we're could, not going to yeah. then say. Right. We're not we gonna do it. Do that. so I, that's how they decided. I agree. I, I think we should. Yep. So. I guess I can make a motion okay. that our uh, RSUD district um, provide tuition up to the state average for uh, religiously affiliated schools. Do we have a second? That was second. Amy made that motion. Robert Mayor seconded. Further discussion? 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That is heaven. What's your presentation? Everything then. Good. Well, I didn't have enough time for it. So. Oh, we didn't get a slide. We had five minutes. Okay, then we're over there. That's it. So, on this piece, I think there is a bunch of things in here to go. Okay. Yep. So, great. All right. Jared, jump in at any point. Tell me what all object codes mean, please. <laughs> all object codes? Everything, so, not just um, salary and benefits, where you'll see where under intervention it says salary and benefits only. Yep. And then all object code is everything that's currently in the budget under that function. So if you think back to your budget presentation, object codes are your 100s, 200s, 300s, 100s being salaries, 200s being benefits, 300 being contracted services, 600 being your supplies, books, that type of stuff. So that's what all object codes mean. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to jump in. I just because we have Robert and Bill are new to yep. this approach. So um, what we did last year, we talked a little bit about the retreat, but I wanted us to get out of the weeds of talking about the small wide items and talk bigger picture. Um, and at the end of the day, other than, of course, you guys, you tuition your students. So that's, that's a big chunk of your budget. But what you have control of, about 85% of personnel. So we're, we try to steer the conversation much more on let's talk personnel, and how personnel support where you're trying to get, mm -hmm. um, and less about $500 budget lines. And so you will get all the budget lines. That will come in December. We talk about the whole budget, um, and then we come back to you off of that feedback in January. And if we have to do two meetings in January, we, we will. But typically, at least this, well, you guys, you're on a different timeline. So you guys are even ahead of because you don't vote till May. So, yeah, we got time. But you got you got a lot of time. But what I would tell you is is that, um, and, and Tara and then you can jump in. But when we talked about student support, uh, this is essentially keeping your staffing the same mm -hmm. that you currently have in student support. So which is which called which from 2022 to 2023. And so, but is this reg ed Paris? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, regular. Yeah, I'm gonna walk you right there. Yeah. yeah. So you get you got a principal and two admin assistants. Yeah. And so uh, this is the, the it's the same as last year, FTE as last year. Yeah. Yes. All of these are just you're I'm gonna, gonna tell me why each line. Okay. So you got a principal and two admin assistants. So Could that be the same. singular principal. Yep. <laughs> Shouldn't be right. Uh, so we've got you budgeting the same in regards to intervention, which is 1.2. That's the same that you budget now currently locally. You've got a school counselor at 1.0, which is the same. Um, the nurse we have still at 1.0. You'll see a change in salary there. That's just a different personnel person. Um, that you have from last year to this year. So that's the change in salary there. And you've got the same in regards to regular ed Paris, three of them, mm -hmm. from this year to next year. Um, and then do you want to talk about those three Paris? Yeah, so two currently support both our preschool programs, and that's a licensing piece. Like to fully enroll to each space is licensed to up to 15 kids for preschool, both in Rochester and Stockbridge, but preschool is under agency of education as well as um, uh, child care. So under two agencies and under the child care licensing piece, if there's more than 10 kids, you have to have two adults. So we support that by having a care educator in each room that supports any preschool program. The Health and Human Services Division. Yeah. So what oversees pre k What's our projected uh, population for next year for pre-K? Uh, uh, pretty close to fall. I don't know. Yeah, it's super early. In What's fall? Fifty in each. Yep. Uh, okay, the way we do that in Rochester is three-year-olds are um, split up in a half-day situation. So there's a group of three-year-olds that come half day Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and a little more than half day on Monday, Tuesday, and the four-year-old come five days a week for a full day. So, um, and then in Stockbridge, 
every well there's some three-year-olds that are half days right now because they're building up socially emotionally to be in full day okay but and then the other para educator in there supports the student on a 504 plan and then the subs we kept at the same level of funding and we still just so you know we do we do look to expand um we use our ESSER funds just because there is more need for substitutes in general right now with COVID and folks being out due to symptoms and things. So we'll continue to pledge it within ESSER additional mm -hmm. substitute funding too. But I feel like this is a good number that you could continue to do what you've been doing, um, you know, year to year. So we keep that right in the budget. Uh, so you see the bottom line in student support as of right now, but before we go to the math interventionist that you have, you have a full-time math interventionist across the two buildings. Um, that's completely um, funded via ESSER funds. At the and moment. will net for uh, FY23? It'll continue for the next two years. Two years. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we'll look to continue to budget that for now. Um, I think we're, you know, as we start to develop your budget this year, one of the things that we may need to look at, remember this is just first draft one, mm -hmm. but as we start next draft, you're gonna get all your teaching, the rest of your teaching staff are gonna be in it plus this. Okay. One of the things we may need to decide is whether or not we wanna add some of that math FTE in your budget, even though we do cover it in yeah. ESSER, to because, start with the bill. Because yeah, it's gonna yeah. be eventually. Yeah. So Esther, Esther is going to end. It is. So I, we didn't do it today for this draft because I feel like we'll have a bigger picture around what's your bottom line looking like. Mm -hmm. For us, I mean, the, the big thing that I've heard in these communities is certainly the excess spending threshold, right? Is an area where we're going to try to make certain we don't go over. So those yeah. are all things we're going to continue to have to massage as we go through the process. Well, they do. I'm very concerned um, that the CLAs in our towns are going to dramatically change, which takes our Pretty budget. Sure. It could actually that. kill our budget because it, you know, and that is that when houses are sold at higher right. price than they were appraised at, it drops our CLA down, which makes it so that our tax dollars don't Dude, go as far. Think about that. Wow. Yeah. Um, so right. unfortunately. Dude. We need to keep that in our minds as Absolutely. well. Darn calculations. And yet it's. I know. Why does it have to be a calculation? Why don't you go the other way? You're going to make more. And money you know, it's so early. Money. We're not even hearing any preliminary yield numbers or things of that yeah. nature. Although right. I'd say that last year this time I was this... really concerned about you know the influx of taxes that we were having coming in from you know just in general business. Right. It seems to me that business is pretty good in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm expecting that the yield will be positive. Uh -huh. um, so that's good news. But certainly the CLA um, is a concern. Yeah, keep it in mind. But I think we're coming up on a, I mean, in the short term, yes, that, that could be a problem. But I think we're coming up on having a, a overall re reassessment. Just that first. And that's good for stock range. Right, for, I know that much. I don't know what. I I, I think we're at year eight or something. Okay. So that's that's getting close then. So it's getting, but I think we're within a couple of years. Okay. Um, and then we, you, uh, Rochester Stockbridge Unified District does have a school-based clinician from Claire Martin that provides um, therapeutic so services. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that is currently budgeted within ESSER. That is one of those things too, though, that we will look to continue to leverage. I would say Medicaid and other grants in general to cover. I don't think that that's something you're going to have to worry about ever necessarily covering in your local budget. Uh, but just know that that is another what, student support. Can you just tell me just just quickly what yeah. the difference between mental health counselor and guidance? Yeah. Is so. I think we're getting better at defining this within our system because I think it used to get pretty mixed. Mm -hmm. um, school counselors are really not trained to be individual therapists, mm -hmm. right? They're trained to help teachers around universal instruction, to help students with a social emotional curriculum. They're trained to implement a social emotional curriculum. They're certainly trained 
to around proficiency-based learning and transcripts and things of that nature. Uh, their focus is different based on whether they wanted to focus more on secondary or primary, but the license is K-12s. Um, I think in general at schools, if, count, if people get into the school counseling profession because they wanted to be a therapist, it's really easy to have that be a big focus part of your time. Mm -hmm. The issue that, that as a system that we recognize with that is, is if you spend your time doing that, you're constantly reacting mm -hmm. to the smaller percentage of students that may need that support. And you're not focusing on all those proactive strategies I just talked about, right? Like implementing a social emotional curriculum, mm -hmm. making certain we're doing PBIS with fidelity. Like PBIS. Positive behavior interventions and supports. Thank you. For Robert. Yeah, no, I remember it. The, um, so we're really trying to say to our school counselors, and this is not just in our side, it's all over the SU. Your focus is on preventative, universal approach to our work. And if someone needs therapy, we're going to get them with a master's level therapist. And so that's the difference. So the mental health counselors are master's level therapists that are going to do that individual therapy work for the student to treat the underlying issues they may have around their internal internalizing or externalizing behaviors we may see um but that that doesn't take away from the school counselor serving all kids mm -hmm. and this service is provided at location at school yeah yeah okay. does she go back and forth she does and the nice thing is they um do build down on medicaid themselves so we're able to get our school-based clinicians at a much, much, much cheaper cost mm -hmm. than it would be if we tried to hire them ourselves. Great, great. Uh, and they have the supervision of um, Claire Martin Center. Mm -hmm. Great. That sounds good. And, yeah, and the system behind them to mm -hmm. be able to yeah. whatever to be and able to. We're trying there. to strengthen our relationship with Claire Martin, uh, and I, we kind of the timing was opportune in the sense of. Um, they were doing a ton of work with Hartford School District and Hartford School District's going with a different provider more closely to them. Um, and so that did open up some resources for Claire Martin. Good. And really under the Claire Martin umbrella, it truly is this districts that they cover are Randolph and us. Mm -hmm. uh, and geographically, we're a huge, we have a huge area for them. And they, they cover um, Bradford too. They have an office over there, but um, we're really looking to try to strengthen that relationship with our community. Mm -hmm. Well, Rochester in the past had a relationship with Clara Martin. Yep, I believe so that. that yeah. So that was good to be able to reestablish that. Yeah, it seemed like we didn't have a lot going on with them when I arrived. Yeah, we did we not. So I, I'm glad that we reestablished that. Good. Yeah. Good. So next month, uh, you're going to get a lot more meat to this be the rest of your instructional programming um, and then we'll you know we'll look to discuss all right where we feel like you need to massage things because in December you'll get everything okay. so. good but in general there's quite a few FTEs there there's you I mean there's three six seven eight nine, like almost ten and we're still at 1.34 percent eight thousand the bottom line so that's a good thing to start with Okay. Good. And this does have anticipated, just so you know, increases in negotiated salaries and projecting benefits of health insurance. Is that projected at 12%, Tara? I would have been 12%. Yeah. 12%. Yeah. Yes, I did a 12% last year. We won't have the actual rates in from Visbit until January. So, based on medical trend, that's what I'm using. And we're again just know we've said that all last year too. We're going to budget conservatively, right? Like we're not going to shortchange insurance budgeting, right? Because uh, you can't make that's really hard to make up for, and then that gets us into a deficit. Place. And you have one person that comes in, you know, as a family, and you didn't budget for it. You just twenty grand right there. And those are some of the gambling that we uncovered that seem to be have been happening yeah. right probably with multiple business managers well it'll be interesting to see once our audit takes place where our um 
where that insurance um because what we funded it at um a higher we, fu we funded the hra's completely the hra's and so i'd be very i'd like to see where that line i'll be happy to see when that what that line comes in at um that was actually used in the budget for um, so hra utilization i can tell you i just got the report from data path Just gotta find where I put it. From January 2021 through September 2021, so you are crossing over fiscal years. Uh, we were at 48.14% utilization of the HRA funds. Okay. And that's across the entire supervisor union. Okay. Does that compare? Is, is there a comparison number from the last the last year's? We were budget? at forty six prior to that. So we had slight increase in utilization. So you think about what happened last year in the medical field with non-emergency surgeries all being put off as a result of COVID. You'll, we yeah. will potentially see additional utilization right. as medical elective surgeries start to open back up again because your HRA is funding your deductibles. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So the budget, for this, the unknowns of the budget are always just, I mean, it's what I really learned being on a school board is how. This is a gamble. Yeah. So much of it is educated, an educated estimate. Oh, educated. We look to our experts to exactly. figure out what no, the best, best guess <laughs> and and cover us well. And you know, that's that's your job and that's our job. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any further questions on this? Let's move on. Board goal. I feel like um, I left our retreat on the eight, at the very end as I was literally walking away, understanding what a goal was. <laughs> After we'd spent like 45 minutes talking about it, I realized I didn't think we actually knew. Um, I'm not sure who wants to handle this. I don't feel like we have them yet. We have protocols, but we don't have goals. Well, I've got some. I mean, I do, I have some too, um, and I just want to, but I want to get a consensus of how we want to go about this, because we could spend hours on this alone. Well, I, I think that, yeah, in general, I mean, an uh, uh, a overview is that we want our, um, our meetings to be largely focused on student achievement, not on, you know, what? academic, Excellence that we do not want to spend our time to before this, Robert. No, let me just because yeah. I, I actually, what do we want to come out of this meeting with? Is what I'm saying. Do we want a list? Yeah, tonight. Do we want a list that then we come back and talk about next time? What are we trying to accomplish tonight? Because then we could, what it is, is that we could start talking about goals and we could talk for which we did a long retreat. Time. We yeah. just kept going. And I, and, I, and, I, and I just want to make sure we have a concrete goal tonight. What do we want to achieve, and that we set a time limit, and then that's it. Just so we. And I don't mean to shut you down because I think it's a very good goal. I just want to. Is our consensus to come away tonight in fifteen minutes, which is what we? No, I don't think we can do that. No, but I, I think a first a first draft of board goals in fifteen minutes. Would be sort of more of an idea throw out. Um, How do we feel I, about that? I took the liberty of. From my notes that I retreat to try to capture the essential areas, the goal setting areas that we focused on. Um, and uh, there are five of them. Uh, and I've got a handout here, which is a super draft, but um, it seems to be one place to start is are these the top five areas that we want to focus goals on? Okay, and if we can have a consensus just on those areas in 15 minutes that will be um i think um time well 
spent, we might find out, no, we don't want five, we need 10, we need not this one, that one. But the focus area is I put each focus area into some language, goal setting language, um, including measures so that we have some sense of whether we've met the goals at the end of the year. So I would like, if with the chairman's permission, Bill, do you have can you pass, pass you that have, out? I don't think it will. Um, and I wasn't able to get. Thank you. Well, let, let's. let's still, I still want to. I still want before we even take action. What are we looking for tonight? Is okay. it to take this list and winnow it down? What do we want to get it to tonight? I think that, that we didn't necessarily hash out all of the ideas at our retreat, and I think it would be helpful if we were to um, put out ideas that we could then future whittle whittle down in the future. So yeah, I feel like we get I, kind of hung up on a couple during the retreat, and I I felt like there was there are more avenues to explore that um, yeah. might be included. I mean, I, I I just you know I've got a big goal that I want to I want us to focus on. Um, also, Lindy and I started just chatting about the idea of a three to five year plan as far as goals, and uh, um, you know there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. In other words. So what is our goal for tonight? <laughs> what is our goal for tonight? What do we want to leave with? First, that's what I said, first draft of our overall goals. Well, again, I want to just again, put this on the table and we can say yay or nay is, do we have the right focus areas? And um, that's a question that this, rough draft will help us do because you'll see very quickly what five key areas are that were coming out of that retreat. Um, what you know, these key areas are not and should we drop them or add to them? And if we can get the key areas, not the actual language of what the goal shall be having to do with that key area, but at least we have a focus thing that we have a consensus on. May not be able to do that in 15 or 20 minutes. But I think it really would help because uh, the first one I've got here is board governance. We talked about setting uh, protocols for how the board conducts its business. And we have a draft of that that Justine and I worked up. Um, that has to do with how efficient and effective, and as Robert says, what our focus is, is a board. Um, and I thought there was some interest at the retreat to develop operating protocols. We don't have to decide that tonight, but that's one key area that came out of the retreat. The second one was, or another one was academic achievement or performance goals. Um, where should the metrics be at the end of this year for our student bodies? What should we be trying to get to? And um, the superintendent is taking the, the lead on that. And um, that's really the core of why we have a board. The third one has to do with funding. Why do we budget? <laughs> and how do we define our budget as being successful or not? That might not be a priority, it might be a different word, it might be budgeting, but it's things like we spend a lot of time on budgeting. What should, what should be the outcomes of that process? The fourth one, enrollment, speaks to um, the idea that if we can grow our student body, both of the number of students and the tuition students, the greater our tradition, uh, tuition revenue is, that supplements our budget. We don't have to be going to the taxpayer if we can grow that. And secondly, every single extra student will allow us more flexibility for spending without tripping the state's spending cap. So if we add five students, and the cap is $18,000, theoretically, we could spend another $18,000 per student before tripping that cap. Reverses, if we lose five students, it makes our budget even tighter. So the one thing here is, can we do something? Should we do something as a board to try to attract parents to get their kids here, um, homeschoolers, whatever the case is, to consider us as being the best little elementary schools. I think it's well worth it, but 
that might not be a focus area we want. And then Ethan, you talked about strong schools and what I heard from you was you want to have something having to do with school structure, buildings. Are we maintaining them? Are we taking care of them? Um, so the educational process uh, can take place. So I stuck that in. I'm not, wasn't absolutely sure where you're aiming at that, but it's, that's a very important area. How do you have an education of the school is falling apart around you? Um, so those are just five areas, uh, but they're important areas. They're not necessarily in priority order. And I'm not suggesting these are the only ones or any of these are, well, I think a number of them are essential, but we can go beyond this. We can do anything we want, but I think it would be helpful, Justine, for you to give us a sense and anybody else saying, look at this and say, hey, I'd rather do this, or I want to do this in addition, um, and, and see how we whittle it down in a few minutes. That's my suggestion. Um, I, this is a, a excellent for me. I guess the idea of goals is broader and um, really has to do with, as Lindy and I started talking about, what kind of school do we want? Not just running a good school, but what kind of school do we want? What do we want it to have? What do we want it to emphasize? Literacy and mathematics given to me. I've, we've already started this push toward outdoor education. I'm, I mean, Rochester Valley, man, arts. You know, we keep saying this, but it's just sort of like, oh yes, arts. And it's not. It's a thing that could make money. It's a thing that could put us on the map as far as as far as what people, why people will come. When we got Waitsfield and Warren, we have a stronger arts program than them. People might even think about coming down here. Killington, same thing. They'll come to Stockbridge if we have a stronger program. So I, I see that this is a bit, but this to me is a little nuts and bolts and management where I really want, I want goals to be dreaming kind of stuff. Not just what we know we can do, but what do we want to do? Justine. Yeah, that that is a, uh, kind of similar to what I was going to say. We we came up with these ideas, but I think on they're under this umbrella of what our mission is. What what is our mission? What um, mm -hmm. we did talk a little bit about social uh, social climate, and um, our, our approach to learning. So I think uh, for me, I, I like hearing these ideas. I wanted to hopefully add, have us all be able to add a few more and yes. tonight in, in a brainstorming manner and then maybe come back and hone it down another time. But um, for me, to piggyback on what you're saying, mi mission, a mission it is, is a big goal. And I think a lot of those things fall underneath that. How are we going to have, how is our board going to govern itself? How are we going to approach funding as a mission? How are we going to, uh, how, how will our mission affect enrollment? How are, will our mission affect um, how kids learn and the, the social climate within which they feel comfortable or don't feel comfortable learning? So um, that was my big idea, but I wanted to open it up to other people who had uh, uh, other ideas and, and the, you know, the, the outdoor learning portion. What does our school look like? And what are other people's ideas that maybe didn't talk at the, at the last uh, meeting as much at the and, retreat? And I, you kind of said the, the word mission and, um, you know, the school has a mission statement mm -hmm. and maybe Maybe even rather than a board goal, maybe we want to revisit what the mission statement of the our, our district is and see if it needs some updating. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I, I, I just, yeah. oh, Robert, you're trying to go for it. Uh, well, as I was alluding to earlier, uh, I, I'm really think, thinking in terms of broader of how do we conduct ourselves and I think an essential part of and, and the essential umbrella under which we conduct ourselves is how much time do we focus on student achievement? 
on what the, the student, the outcomes are for the students. How much of our, each of our meetings do we spend on that? If we're spending all our, I mean, in the, it's, it's all over the map of how much time boards spend on budget, on, on trivial details and such, where I so was job. very excited that we, we can be spending the majority of our time of, of every meeting working on what the outcomes are for the students. Well, yes. And then, and then, I mean, these can come under that, but if we're spending it, you know, on trivia, that's not, I mean, the, the goal is for us to spend time on, on outcomes for students. Yeah. And, and that's an important goal. I think that then you start going down the line of, okay, how, how do we budget our time to spend on other things or accomplishing, well, accomplishing that. I mean, that gets, you know, student achievement and it's very easy to stay, spend all our time of that looking at, um, you know, these charts. And I just think there's some really interesting ways of teaching well that that I, I'd like to explore. That so that we're giving Lindy not just the goal be a good school, but it's almost I feel like I want to be a unique school, be an exciting school. Because I think that's the big difference is that this is everything we're hearing tonight and the kind of thing this is how to be a good school. But it's not for me yet how to be an extraordinary school. Sharon Academy, I have to say, has created a model for how to be an extraordinary school. And not that we follow their thing, but I think in terms of their vision, uh, this is the time. Finally, we've gotten so many of the distractions out of our way that we can now say, not just nuts and bolts, good student teaching literacy, but literally, what do we want to be as a school? What is that, you know? Um, and that's, to me, it's a, it's a really big picture statement. And, and all of this, of course, is a given. You know, and this is why this list is so good, because this is a given for me, that this is what we're about. But it's even bigger than that, that we're the visionaries who give this message to our administration, and she says, wow, okay. Here's, here's how we make a three and five year plan to get to that vision. So I think if you're talking that big of a vision, it, then you need to have all the stakeholders at the table, which includes parents, kids, staff, myself, because that's what you represent. It's mm -hmm. that whole group. So if if that's the direction well, we're heading, you know. I think we, which is a good, I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm uh -huh. just saying we need to have all the stakeholders involved in building that vision. So it doesn't just become this group of six people plus myself and Jamie. Well, yeah, and I'm, so, I, 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 you know, I've been, I've been so focused in some ways. I like the last meeting. It's like I've been so focused on damage control, right, for years now, and and like to finally be able to get creative as a board member excites me. And and maybe it's not the job of a board member. Maybe I should leave. You know, in some ways, because, but I I do think it's the opportunity to start. So maybe your Not, goal is a community engagement well, building I mean, yeah, around I mean, the vision. Your goal may be then to relook at your mission and vision over the next six to eight months. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if that's the goal, mm -hmm. then I would also look for us to bring in a facilitator to do that really important work, mm -hmm. right? And because I think there's multiple steps you should take in doing so. So when Amy brought up your mission and vision again, your goal may be just that, that you're going to have cre recreated and, and revised your mission and vision, which is going to drive the direction of your school um, moving forward, right? And so, you know, what I hear you articulating, you know, um, Ethan, is, you know, there are schools that are expeditionary learning schools, right? And we could do a whole bunch of professional development in that. And what I mean by that is that they teach all their content through expedition um, and it's thematic units of study. That is not how you're set up right now, nor no. our approach, but, well, it, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have that. Well, and it also means in the district that you couldn't have a school that even specialized in one thing. 
and that there was choice within interdistrict choice within your schools right around that so this is the i think that those are the bigger conversations that, mm -hmm. that you may be asking for and i think to do that that your goal may be to really dig into that work mm -hmm. um and i was gonna and i would say if we're going to do that that we should hire someone that does that work professionally that helps us facilitate that conversation i think it and, might be well, well and i think we can also make well a decision. Spent. We can also make a decision on the board whether we want to do that. I mean, that may be my vision solely, and that's that's this is where we have a board, and not one person makes the decision. Is that we need a consensus of you know maybe just running a good school is fine for everybody. Um, I'd like to push it a little harder myself. See, I guess when I read um, this agenda item, the board goals, I was thinking more as a body. What can we can have under three hour meetings? Like something oh. we can do. We can be more efficient with our time and and in you know here. And a lot see, of I think that's these, the protocol. These, I think that's the protocol. That's how how we manage ourselves. Well, we're not doing we could have the goal to, to do our protocols. <laughs> well, no. I, you know, I, well, um, I, 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 I have know. to say, okay, so we have, clearly we have different visions of what goals are. Right. And we have to find a way can, to come together on what is a board goal. And uh, I'm not sure. We, maybe we don't know how to do that. And maybe it isn't something that happens in, you know, uh, five more minutes. I don't know. I, I don't think we should get hung up about definition. I think we should try to air, and this is the great brainstorming time tonight, to air those things that we're passionate about mm -hmm. as parents, as citizens, as school board directors. Um, and, uh, and capture those in some meaningful way so that we can use those as a guidance tool not just to talk about but do something over the next six months a year whatever your time frame is and that's the the things about goals is they like to have a, a result area that's clear so you know when you got there and you know where you're going and um but right now we're playing around what's the most important things we could be going after and we've got some nuts and bolts things that i think are essential if we're going to be not only a good school but a school but a great school and we're not there yet. You looked at the scores tonight. They didn't tell us we were a great school yet. At the same time, you're zeroing in. And I think that's exciting. Thing, same with Justine. But what about, what could we do to make it exciting and special? And they don't have to be either or. We can, we can I think we'll probably have to whittle down the number. But if there's a board consensus, we could go after a number of those things. And... Some will take longer than others, and I agree with Jamie's view. Um, they're going to take probably um, professional help, and if we're talking about vision, we certainly have to involve the community. Yeah. So that will take some time, but that doesn't mean it's not important. And I think what I'm excited about is that we spend time together defining what's important for us, moving ahead, and do it in a constructive way where we can go after it. And uh, and it could be five, it could be three, it could be ten. And I think tonight's been helpful because we've got some new things on the table. Um, and so we can we can we can do some more of this, um, just to find what's important, and then try to actually come up with a goal statement with a specific result. And it's in a specific time frame, because when you look at a board goal, absolutely, like, is this a goal for six absolutely. months, for a year? Yeah. Uh, and we are at 21 minutes on this. So all this was just in my draft was the, the definition with the school year. Uh, the test results come out, you know, the, the, the summer or something. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't have multi-year goals, which is which is where we hope to be in the first year. But it's going to be a five-year effort. And right. our our goal in uh, is to have a to review our mission and vision statement and that's we either have goal. it. Yes. You know that that could be a goal. Well, Absolutely. Let's, let's finish up with Robert, and we're, yep. we're not done with this. We'll bring it back yep. next time. Robert? Okay. Uh, just, uh, the, Jamie, you had uh, an example of a goal at our retreat. Could you, do you remember it? And could you repeat that? 
because it was fairly limited in scope and I like that contrast to what we're it was yeah so uh, for for White River Unified District they've been starting to uber focus on more personalized based learning mm -hmm. and more multiple pathways toward learning so a concrete goal that they gave the administration was is that all grade levels seven through 12 will have a rigorous and public display of learning by the spring of 2023. So they gave a year and a half, but they also, they didn't say what it had to be. And what the administration will do will be continuing to provide monitoring reports on that goal of how they're gonna get to that end. The other thing that they wanted was student like conferences implemented grades four through eight by next fall. And that aligned to our work in proficiency based learning and pathways, yeah. right? So it wasn't an add on, it's part of what we're doing. But that was, those were two tangible goal or goals that the board set out for the administration to then work with their faculty to get to. So it was specific, measurable, achievable, it was definitely relevant. And it was, you know, there was a time on it. Good. Let's move on. Yeah. I presume we'll, this will be on, we need to be on yeah. the we the general. Out what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you guys did a good job on for this. Mm -hmm. I, I think four, five, and six all speak to the same thing. Um, so I didn't know if there was a better way that we could uh, combine them. It talks about the uh, the path of communication um, through complaints and just staff communication and um, the complaint procedure. Yeah. So you're under the. Uh, Three, four, and five, or, or four, five, six of the proposed RSUD board protocols. Yes, four, five, and six. Yeah, pretty much from the Vermont uh, School Board Association's indicators of an effective board. And I did a little word smithing, and they had like twenty-one okay. indicators. Um, Safford had like twenty-one or something, and I whittled it down to one page. You're right. I, I think our chair was did not want to, to slew them. So to the extent that we can, um, if we're duplicating or we can, um, if we're being unnecessarily repetitious, um, we can certainly um, change that. Um, well, yeah, it says uh, all staff communication with the board and board requests that the staff should go through the superintendent. Yeah. All personnel complaints and criticisms received by the board or its individual members are directed to the superintendent. The board will encourage others others to follow the board's policy on complaint procedures concern and probably address the issue. I just, I mean, it's fine. We can keep it like that. I just felt no, that it was um, kind of um, saying the same thing over and over again. My suggestion is, would you give it a good edit? Uh, my father was an editor, and it's a very um, wonderful skill. I mean, it, it, you can make it clearer and shorter and um, reduce the verbiage and still convey what we're trying to do here. Uh, there are important things. One is yeah. a kind of a chain of command. That's number four. Um, and uh, that we go through the superintendent so that we're not having independent ex parte communications without his knowledge. Um, so I think that's that's an important one. The, the fifth one has to do with when when there's incoming tomatoes being thrown at our staff uh, or at the board um, or at the staff that we got to make sure that it, it flows through the superintendent. Um, and then the individual parent or something having a problem in the classroom, uh, the recommended procedures is you go to the teacher if that doesn't solve the problem you go to the principal if that doesn't solve the problem you go to the superintendent if that doesn't solve the problem it goes to the to us so um, right what's the so, difference between four and five you have the staff communication uh with the board and the board request of the staff should go to the superintendent and five is all personnel complaints could it be all personnel and staff communication complaints and criticisms sure. yep. 
on I'm not wedded to it's this is our kind of okay this is our it's like a, the Boy Scouts creed you know you get your 10 things and you know, yeah. that's the principles of both and um Again, I didn't do any of this. This came from a wonderful book called Governance Core School Board Superintendents and Schools Working Together. Um, I think um, four and five should be differentiated between maybe staff and uh, or uh, personnel and community because community people uh, mm -hmm. provide complaints and criticisms. Maybe we could yeah. kind of change those, those two uh, in that way. Yeah, and, and maybe some of my... Um, Stumbling here is the fact that we use staff and personnel. Aren't are they the same people? Staff is in four and personnel is in five. Aren't we talking about the same people, but we're giving them two different names? I think um, so. Yeah. Um, I, I thought one was about communications and one because is more about dealing with. Um, so let's let's redo that. Oh my gosh. Um, one thing that. One of our goals in approving some sort of operating protocols and governance is that we all understand have the same understanding of what they mean, what the words mean. Right. <laughs> and what you pointed out is there's a shortcoming in um, uh, two or three of these things that need to be either clarified or simplified or combined. And so, um, um, I'll you know, Justine and I could go after those. Um, yeah, I think you guys um, did a great job though, with coming down to this. It, it, Really, I think it's great. Um, what I love is number seven. The yes. efficient and effective <laughs> long board meetings should be avoided. And but it speaks to um, and we do a lot of those things now about setting time limits and public speaking have so many minutes, all those sorts of things. Um, and Robert talks about um, focusing on kind of like the policy sort of things um, and making sure those get um a fair and complete hearing if that's the case then um anything that can be um basically considered operating items uh, remains with the superintendent and the, and the principal and that sort of thing um well if i can i really like that you guys um have the principles and the protocols. I like that the, that those are distinguished from each other, and the principles to me really get, like guide how you do your business. Yes, you know, like it's like this is what's really important to us. And so I, I like how you differentiated those. And Robert, number one is is is, is you speaking. I hope mm -hmm. under uh, governance principles. Um, um, and you know, number two, this is what I've learned and seen uh, from our board chair, uh, the importance of teamwork and working together as a team and, and a focus and purpose. And that's, that's going to help us achieve what we want to achieve. Um, I gotta say, I get more out of the principles than I do out of the protocols. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't know, maybe it's the kind of person I am, but I mean, principles tell me and it's so easy to take that in, the other part of the six. Um, and I just think the other ones, the protocols are the, the weeds a little bit that are useful to know about and, and go to refer to, but really the principles for me are the useful tools. Well, let me just give you a, I think we need both. I think the upper level, um, broad principles are absolutely, I mean, that's where it gets down to. But then you get, I'm a new board member. Uh, I was really not told, um, I read a bunch of stuff was, can I just call uh, Lindy? Why can't I just go see Lindy? Tell her what I think or what I want her to do. I've got plenty of ideas. We're not supposed to operate that way. Mm -hmm. right. Well, it, so it helps to have some something specific so I don't stumble. No, no. I, um, and I there's agree. so many ways to stumble, mm -hmm. meaning good. Uh, another good way is having a strong opinion, having a vote, you lose the vote, and you don't support the vote. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that's the opposite of being a, a team member. So there's some things I think, and these don't have to be, this isn't the Magna Carta, but I think some things have to be clear so that whether you're a 20 year board member or as far as uh, experience or just coming on like myself, 
um, we're ready to, that we understand better what our expectations are. I think yeah. this is helpful for the community as well to understand what the expectations are and what the role is, um, specifically the protocols, and to not expect more than that of an individual person. So I, I took away being kind of glad to see that that would be something that you know other people might, might see and maybe treat us differently, in certain situations. Yeah. Well, I think if we can just clarify, you know, the I guess the wording of four and five, um, and maybe um, maybe in six. Um, we specify, I mean, do we want to specify the person who can uh, expeditiously address their issues because we're telling them to go to the superintendent and to the, I don't think we even say in here to go to the principal anywhere. Let's take a look at those. It's, um, uh, yeah, we also have the Stafford has much longer number of, of protocols, so you could refer back to that which Jamie passed out at the yeah, retreat. Okay. And then all of us should have copies of the essential work of school boards on page 65 or 66 is the Vermont School Board Association's take on this as well. So, um, and I took some of this language out of that and right. it, you're pointing out very, very wisely that it's unclear and it's possibly duplicative. Well, that means it isn't working. Do you think maybe we could all um, take this and and bring back our suggestions of rewording certain yeah. pieces? Yeah, I think that would be a good at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah. Because uh, you know well, I've looked well, at it quite a bit. But... Uh, I I would to um, Ethan's point uh, of speaking about our our broader goals, um, that number 12 in the board protocols, there's a lot of, of number 12 that I think it should be in the governing principles, especially with regard to vision. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that. I mean, that, that's that's something I think we, we should consider in, when we come back and, and look at this. Because it was, it's, so I, I, I think this is excellent governing principles, but but it's it's um, how would I say um, it's a how, but it doesn't say where we're going. Mm -hmm. Did you have it right there? I agree. I agree with that. That 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 seems right. It, it doesn't have to be big, but it's I think it needs to be up there. Yeah, it does seem to be up there. You didn't have it there. Yeah, thank you, Robert. But thank I'm sure if we all spend a little more time with it, we might um, come up okay. with some more adjustments that might ring true, and we can kind of hash it out, you know, next time and finish it. Good. So we'll bring it back. That we. I don't think there's bring it back with more notes. Excellent. Great. Um, I'll, I'll just add to you guys. I think this work is like zero based budgeting, right? Like you're going to work really hard to get this right now, and then mm -hmm. you, you'll be able to tweak it as you move forward, you know, sort of future well, boards. Yeah. And this wasn't even a possibility mm -hmm. in the last three years. Yeah. It just wasn't even a possibility. There was huge glaring goals right in front of us that we didn't pick. But that were that had to be dealt with. So this is all lovely stuff, really. It's just great. Good. Okay. Um, We've done nine, haven't we? Yes, we've done nine. Nine. We did nine. Uh, the end of ten. Inquiries and resignations. We have one resignation. Uh, Elwin oh. Twitchell has resigned uh, effective this coming Friday. Uh, and so we're going to be searching for uh, a custodian. Um, for our schools. Uh, we may look, just so the board knows, possibly at trying to use some ESSER money, specifically when we think about capital improvement and just some delayed maintenance. We may focus 
our energy on looking at someone who's more focused on being the do maintenance work. Yeah, save us some money. Yeah, it would save us some money. I think across your two buildings right now, I get really concerned. Like, I went and the customer, the maintenance guy in Strap comes and did things like fix your, your like all your the swing sets, the and we just have to have someone with staff that can do that. You're you got two buildings. Yeah, you really need someone with a maintenance background. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that what we will look to do is leverage ESSER funds to do that. What's his FTE as he's leaving? Uh, Part-time. 0.5. 0.5? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're looking to make that up to a full? Yep. I think okay. we need to. And then you will come up with a strategy of how to pay for that in the future? Moving forward. Yep. Okay. Both in the near term and the long term. Great. That sounds good. But yeah, it just... Yeah, this your district is, you know, one. We still have a couple other districts where we don't have that type of level of position, but your your district needs it, and so if we have the opportunity to do that, do you think we we'll should. find the applicant? You know, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Good. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful. I mean, it, what we will do is we still have custodial work that needs to happen in the meantime, right? And so we'll look to utilize subs. Mm -hmm. um, to make certain that your buildings are taken care of. But, this is where the SU can really help out that. Part. But, um, we, you know, I think that just as we look to, again, take your district to the next notch, this is a position that, you know, we really need. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look, what you look at the master agreement and what that's going to cost, it's not significant enough that we shouldn't be doing it. Great. I mean, I think in general, we'll probably save enough to pay for it almost. Mm -hmm. Do we need to have a motion to accept this resignation? Just to accept it, yeah, accept for it. your policy. It's a strange um, thing. Can we move to accept the resignation? Yes, well, you accept resignation. With appreciation. It's been yeah, around for a while, too. I make a motion to accept Ellen Twitchell's resignation with appreciation. Mm -hmm. A second. Robert, second. Motion made by Justine. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Public comment? You're here. Tim? No, Red Sox game. Oh, Tim, what's the score? Where are you? Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. We can't hear you. You're muted. And it looks like you have a hat on. Get your buds out. Good. Oh. And maybe disappear. What's the score? <laughs> That's all we care about. Ooh, already two now. You know, so no. What? Two nothing. He said. Oh, great. That's the public comment. For that level of public comment, we're great. Oh, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, Michaela, do you have any public comments? Nothing. Great. Thank you so much. All right, future agenda items. I've got, uh, we're going to be doing a presentation yeah. on your outdoor education program that right. will include Excellent. your students and faculty. Um, and uh, the next draft of the budget, of course, will be on the agenda. You've got your policy, uh, sorry, your, your goals and protocols. The anti racism policy will hopefully be there for adoption. Mm -hmm. um, so I have all those things and whatever else folks want to look to add. And if you don't know now, email Ethan and we'll work to get it on. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything else? Um, the only other one thing I want to say is I bought for the first time this beautiful generator in place at Stockbridge. It's we gorgeous. It's in place. Almost there. Okay. We're it's great. on the um, installation of the propane. Great. Well, that's, that's what that news. thing is, that big pipe. That's wonderful. Inside. That's my understanding. Okay, good. But it looks, it looks amazing. It's director, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was that's like I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting another tent, and I walked around the corner, and it was this thing, and it looked great. Yeah. And I like that it's out front where people can see it. That's great. Good. Um, I'm going to enter. I think the neighbor would be. Next meeting date is Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. The day after my birthday, I guess you all know. Uh, regular meeting stock at Stockbridge campus and by Google Meet. 
I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, good night Aye. and thank you. Yeah. Good night.